Good afternoon. OK, so I'm doing three really dumb things. Um, the first thing I'm doing is, so Catherine asked me to, to be on a, on a track. She's talking about like IT technology and society and how, how society kind of relates to technology and how we apply it and all of that. I thought, that sounds like a fascinating topic. I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. So, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll need to put a new talk together. So this is a new talk. So that's the first dumb thing I'm doing. The second dumb thing I'm doing is following Linda Rising. So, <laughs> so if you're in Linda Rising's talk, that was amazing. Um, and the third dumb thing I'm doing is standing between a room full of Dutch people and beer, <laughs> right? So, so I'm gonna, I, I, I then did a couple of other dumb things, um, which I'll introduce as we go. Uh, but let's start there. Uh, first, a word from our sponsor. Um, here we go. There's an app. Please ask questions throughout the session. Um, and then uh, I will, of course, run out of time at the end, so you won't get to answer any of them, but at least you get the, the, the wonderful internal glow of having posted the question. Okay, um, I might tweet some answers later. So this talk then, um, I was thinking about, particularly with technology and society, how we as society, how we as human beings adopt technology. And there's uh, something that fascinated me um, recently, probably in the last year or so. Um, a chap called Eli Goldratt, Eliahu Goldratt, uh, died a few years ago, sadly. Um, massive brain, very, very smart guy. So he was a physicist, and he was also probably one of the most significant management thinkers of the 20th century. And he wrote a, a seminal book in 1984 called The Goal. And this, uh, it was one of a, around that time, there were a couple of books came out. There's this one and a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by an English teacher philosopher called Robert Persig. And they were novels, so like business books, philosophy books, presented as novels. And they had real trouble getting them published. So, so Goldratt was quite a successful um, business consultant by this point. And he wrote this, this novel, and it's about a guy called Alex who works in a factory. He actually runs a factory, and the factory's going down the tubes, and Alex, Alex's marriage is on the rocks, and it's all doom and gloom for Alex. And he meets up with an old school teacher called Jonah, and Jonah... Uh, kind of coaches Alex in terms of figuring out why the organization's not working terribly well, and um, it, it all ends up okay in the end, so don't worry. Okay, this is not a depressing story. Um, so, and it led, it kind of led the, led, led the groundwork for a whole load of, you get a lot of these sort of uh, business novels now. So the most obvious one is The Phoenix Project, which was written as a direct homage to the goal, but kind of brought forward 30 years to, to the DevOps world. But there's a whole load of these business books now, things like Five Dysfunctions of a Team, um, where you start with like a fable and then it unpacks the fable. So The Goal was a really significant book, and it introduced this idea of theory of constraints. And theory of constraints is about how, is, it's, it's how you can apply lean operations and lean thinking to improvement in an organization. I don't want to talk about that today. I met a chap called Kevin Baer, who's one of the co-authors of The Phoenix Project a few years ago very, very smart, very personable human being. Um, and he said to me, if you like the goal, because I'm you know, bouncing around and massively into this whole theory of constraints thing, he said, if you like the goal, you're going to really like beyond the goal. So I thought, what's beyond the goal? And he said, well, it's a, I, when, when he told me, I thought I heard book, but it's a series of lectures, a series of eight lectures that, uh, that Goldratt gave 21 years later. So he's written this book, um, you know, so, so theory of constraints, lean operations isn't eating the world 20 years later, and he's a little bit perplexed by that. So if you look, um, in fact, this version of the goal, the latest version of the goal, have, has a wonderful extended interview with him in the back where he talks a bit about that. But so beyond the goal is this series of lectures that he gave, um, and again, you know, he dies like six years later, so this is towards the end of his life. And, oh my word, if you think the goal is, like, everyone has to, who's read the goal? Let's just get a hand. Oh, okay, so about 10% of you in this room, everyone else, your homework is to go and read the goal. It is wonderful, it's life-affirming, it's brilliant. Once you've read the goal, in about two years' time, once you've really internalized it, then you're probably ready for beyond the goal. So beyond the goal, is, and, and he's, he's an old Jewish guy, 
And so he speaks like an old Jewish guy, which basically means he's amazing at telling stories, because old Jewish guys are amazing at telling stories. And he laughs at his own jokes, because he does. He's got a very kind of light sense of humor. And he's got <laughs> kind of little, just cheeky kind of, you know, indulging himself laughing. It's joyful to listen to. And so what he does in about the first five seconds of this, of this first lecture is he drops a bombshell, and you, know, and you think, oh, I'm quite good at this stuff, and then you listen to him, and your brain explodes, or my brain exploded. And he said, I'm just going to make a statement. And he makes this statement. He says, uh, he says, technology can bring benefits if and only if it diminishes a limitation. And he says, I'll, I'll say it again. He says, I, I, I'm not very good at old Jewish men voices. But he says, I'll say it again. Technology can bring benefits if and only if it diminishes a limitation. And then he proceeds to spend the next like, two lectures, two hours of this eight-hour thing, unpacking that sentence. And what happened was my brain melted. And I realized it, what he's doing is he's articulating beautifully why we really struggle to adopt technology. And so what I want to do today is try and unpack some of that for you. So what I've done is he uses two examples, which I want to give you. Um, I've then added another two. So I've basically doubled the amount of content, and I'm going to try and do that in about a half the time, which means I'm going to speak quickly, OK? Because I'm English, and that's what I do. So if you struggle with me speaking English quickly, do put your hand up. I'll ignore you, but at least you'll know that you, know, you put your hand up. So technology can bring benefits if and only if it diminishes a limitation. So let's take a look. What is technology? What is technology? So of course I did what anyone does. I jumped on the Googles, looked at dictionary.com, looked at Merriam-Webster, and technology is a really big paragraph about stuff. Okay, it's quite hard to describe. Um, however, both of these things have a few key words in common. They both talk about knowledge. So technology is about knowledge, and most importantly, it's about the application of knowledge. So if I just study something, that's philosophy. Okay, if I then apply that knowledge to something, that's technology. Okay? So the practical application of knowledge, accomplishing a task, using knowledge, interrelation of knowledge with life. So you're actually applying it to do stuff. So, okay. Here's what I concluded from listening to Ellie Goldratt for a couple of hours. We're really, really bad at adopting new technology. Okay? That's generally my conclusion. In fact, that's not strictly true. We're great at adopting new technology. We love new technology. We've got this whole, um, the lovely adoption curve of you know, uh, early adopters and pioneers jumping on these things, and then the early majority come along a bit later. The thing we're really bad at is exploiting new technology. Okay, we're rubbish at exploiting new technology. What does that mean? What I want to do is give you a series of examples of technology advances over the last probably 50 years. Um, and unpack those a bit. But essentially, what, what Goldratt says is this. Is he says, when we have a new technology, there's four questions we need to ask ourselves in order to figure out how to exploit that technology. And we need to ask these questions in order, and we need to answer these questions in order, and if we don't do that, we will not get the benefit from the technology. So these four questions unpack the if and only if. OK, so if you're going to write anything down, this is the stuff to write down. The first thing is this. What is the power of the technology? What does it do? And he says, this is the easy one, because there's people selling it. <laughs> Listen, read the sales brochures, watch the adverts, that's what it does. OK, it makes your whites a new bluey white that'll hold up against the window, or it makes your car go faster, or it makes the journey smoother, or it makes whatever it is. It's a phone, but without any buttons, because what we need is a phone with fewer buttons. OK, the, the power of the technology, what, what benefit does it give us? Then he says, well, this is the if and only if bit. What limitation does the technology diminish? If we can't identify what limitation the technology diminishes, all the other bets are off. So there needs to be a specific thing that says, right now we have this limitation, this thing that's, we, well, that's, that's a problem for us. Um, and we have to be able to demonstrate that this technology diminishes that limitation. This is surprisingly difficult. And the reason this is surprisingly difficult is because mostly those uh, limitations are hiding in plain sight. We've gotten used to them. It's like asking a fish, how's the water? And a fish is like, what's water? Yeah, 
because it's in it, it's around it all the time. Um, and again, as I say, I want to give you a few examples and unpack that a little bit. So what limitation does the technology diminish? Now it gets interesting, because now we ask ourselves, what rules enabled us to manage that limitation? We've, we've had that limitation, we've always had that limitation. We need rules in order to manage that limitation, so what are those rules? Because if we don't dismantle those rules, we don't get any of the benefit of the technology, because we're still constraining ourselves by rules that work right now for the thing we used to have. There's a few people nodding already, yeah, sort of trying to apply this. What, what, the problem with Ellie Goldratt is he says these things, and they hit you like a, you know, the, the punch in the stomach thing, they hit you like a sack of sand, and you suddenly, and it might be confirmation bias, but you suddenly see it everywhere. You know, one of the things I do, a lot of the work I do is going into organizations and helping them see things differently. Okay? The amount of constraints I run into that are exactly this. We have rules that enable us to manage the limitation, and we are wedded to those rules. And finally, well, we've introduced this new technology, and it's going to give us some new capability. Okay? We're going to need some new rules. We're going to need some new rules that enable us to manage this new thing. Okay, so, and these new rules aren't usually the not of the existing rules. They're different things. So this means we have some work to do. So I can't just go, ta-da, here's a new technology, here's electricity. Now you just go, and electricity, all the things, and you'll be fine. Yeah? Uh, the agricultural revolution, here's farming, right? Well, so if you approach farming the same way you approach hunting and gathering, it ain't going to work out so well. You need to think about things differently. And likewise, if we go into the industrial age, which we did, thinking it was just like the pre-industrial age, everything was really difficult for ages while well, we figured stuff out. Then we industrialized, and then we got very much into your scientific manage management from the early 20th century. Your, uh, Frederick Wilmsley Taylor, and Henry Gantt, and Henry Ford, and all those very, you know, guys with very big brains. Um, and then post-industrial, we carried on using those models. Okay, so this is how you adopt a new technology. Let's take a look at some examples. Who's heard of MRP? This is an age test. Who's heard of MRP? Okay, two hands was two more than I was expecting. <laughs> okay, this is probably one of the first applications of computer technology in business. Well, certainly one of the first widespread applications of computer software packages in business. MRP is Materials uh, Requirements Planning, is what it stands for. If you're in a factory, if you're in any manufacturing context, and you build stuff for customers, then you have an order book, and you have customers, and you need to build those orders. You need to fulfill those orders. In order to fulfill those orders, you need material. Now, if you over-order material, you have a sunk cost problem. Okay? You have an inventory problem. If you under-order, you have a resource starvation problem. So getting the right amount of materials is absolutely critical to running a safe cash flow, uh, well-running manufacturing business. And this was a huge, huge, well, it still is a huge deal. This was a huge deal in the mostly manufacturing late uh, 20th century. So 50s and 60s uh, and 70s, uh, in the Western world particularly. So what we have is, in a typical factory, you might have 20% of the workforce were very, very smart, highly paid number crunchers, and they would be off in an office somewhere doing the materials resource plan, uh, the material requirements plan. And the material requirements plan may well take a week to calculate the material requirements for them next month. Okay? And so what we did is we did it every month, and it would take a week to, to calculate painstakingly, because it was error-prone, it was manual and all those things, the, the, the material requirements for the following month. If you got it wrong, you either had way more spend than you needed, or you suddenly were unable to fulfill orders. Both of those are really, really dangerous, especially in a low-margin manufacturing scenario. So then a bunch of clever folks said, we can make a computer do this. And so they did. And so they invented this MRP software. That was the first wave of like package software. And DuPont was one of the first, the very early adopters of this. And DuPont went, this is awesome, right? We can now literally run our MRP calculation overnight. And because they could run overnight, they, become one of the, they became one of the largest manufacturing firms in the world, right? Certainly in, in the US, they were, they were huge still are pretty significant. Uh, um, and so 
Then what happened was loads of other companies went, well, look, we need to compete with the likes of DuPont. What's their secret? And they said, oh, MRP, you should get some MRP software. And they went, brilliant. And they all adopted this MRP software, and they're like, nothing's happening. <laughs> we put the pixie dust on it, nothing's happening. Why, why is nothing happening? And so you can look at this scenario. This is before my time. This is an Ellie Goldratt story. I, I have my own stories. But he said he lived through this, and he was consulting into firms while this was going on, and he didn't recognize this. It's only in retrospect. This is like 20-odd years after this has all happened. He's going, I get it. I see it now. And he says, so let's unpack this MRP scenario using these four questions. So the first question then, what is the power that MRP systems uh, provide? What is the power of that technology? What does it allow me to do? Right, these really, really complicated calculations, I can do them overnight, which is amazing, right? And carry out complex MRP calculations, and they're done by the following morning. Wow. Okay, so what limitation then, what limitation does this diminish? Yeah. So the limitation it diminishes is right now it takes an entire week for a skilled team to calculate MRP for just for the next month. Yeah. It's time consuming, it's expensive, it's error prone. I probably have teams doubling up on calculations because there's lots and lots and lots of paperwork involved. So then what are the existing rules that made it possible for me to do materials resource requirements planning in a large factory? What rules did I have that said, this is what we're gonna do? So the rules here, we can only plan monthly. That's one of the rules, right? Planning more than monthly, Right, is, is, is risky, okay, but planning less than monthly is too expensive. I can't do it, yeah? So monthly is about the right cadence. If I'm spending a, a week a month, that's probably about right. Anyone who's using Scrum, right, spending, like one of the people I, uh, I was working with someone recently, and I said, so, you know, how are you finding all this agile stuff? He's always oh, using Scrum. He said, he said, it's doing my head in. I said, why is that? He said, all the meetings. I'm like, but it's, it's agile, you don't have meetings. He goes, oh, you don't call them meetings. Yeah, you call them stand-ups and retrospectives and sprint planning and, and backlog grooming. And the, the word meeting isn't in there, but they're all meetings. And you know, a significant chunk of my week is in meetings. I'm like, yeah, you nailed it. <laughs> You're absolutely right. So that means that you can't have shorter sprints than that because it's just too expensive. They figured out the same thing. Okay, It takes a week, a month to do the planning. And we need to buy big enough batches. I need to order big enough batches to last me a month. So these were the rules that I had in place. So now, what new rules are going to enable us to exploit this technology, enable us to benefit from this technology? And, and so, well, the first thing is we need to replan frequently. So DuPont realized that if I could make these calculations overnight, I could basically order overnight, which is pretty cool. I could certainly order much more frequently. And also, I can order in shorter time frames, which means I can order short, smaller batches which means, say there's something wrong with the batch, there's less goods to send back. So I start creating this win-win-win of smaller batch size. This was an accident, a happy accident. But then, that means a bunch of things. In order to exploit this technology, we need to change the relationship with our suppliers right, and with our customers. In terms of our suppliers, I need to say, can you deliver smaller batches more frequently? Right now, you have a massive series of trucks that turn up every you know, 30th of the month or whatever. Um, you know, for, for, my, for my goods for the next month. What I actually want now is, can you send like very small vans every couple of days? And for a lot of their supply chain, that was completely mind-blowing for them. They had to retool and rethink a load of things. And a lot of them said, no, we can't. Okay? And don't forget, if only DuPont are doing this and everyone else isn't, then basically the market's pretty flat. There's no one's, no one's at risk because they're not keeping up. It's only as you cross that chasm, and now some of the early, uh, early majority and late majority start adopting these systems, that the laggards are now exposed as, as not being able to respond. And I can also change a relationship with my customers. Hey, customer, you can change your mind. You can order in smaller amounts, so you've got less value at risk, you've got less sunk cost, okay? As you realize whether your customers, are, your customers are buying product or not, you can change the size, the configuration, all of that kind of stuff, yeah? In the late 80s, early 90s, um, Dell Computing created a, a, a multi-billion dollar business model around this. So up until Dell, you basically, when you bought a computer, it was, it was the Henry Ford, you know, any color you like as long as it's black. Yeah? HP, Compaq, all the big vendors, IBM, are saying this is what a computer looks like. And Dell were like, how much memory do you want? 
how large of a hard drive, how big of a screen, all the other configurations. And you just had sliders, and you just moved all the sliders, and you went ship. And it would arrive. And it would typically arrive before your order would arrive anyway from the other guys. So they had this whole supply chain thing down. And they became, you know, Michael Dell became a billionaire because he could work in smaller batches, right? So we need to change our relationship with our suppliers and our customers. Um, once we do that, we can outmaneuver our competitors. This is pretty cool. But until we do that, we are basically constrained by exactly the same rules we were using before. And this is what was wrong-footing all of DuPont's competitors. Is they were using these systems, and they were still doing their MRP calculations every month. Every month, they would run them overnight. And then the following month, they'd run them overnight again. So they were getting this, you know, it's much cheaper. We've got this huge cost saving. We don't need these rooms full of you know, expensive uh, calculating human beings anymore. But we're getting none of the business benefit. We've managed to save a few bucks on salary. Brilliant. Right? DuPont's busy changing how manufacturing works. Yeah? Because they were still clinging to their old rules. So the first kind of takeaway I got from this is this. All those rules that we use for coping, they become policy. And once those rules are policy, it's really hard to unpick those rules. Okay, because different people own those rules, and different people kind of coll collect around those rules. So the policy is we plan monthly. There's a monthly meeting that we have. That's policy. Big enough batches is policy. So you've got Ron, who works in the warehouse, and he's used to the trucks coming in. And you know what? He's quite slow moving and quite ponderous and very thorough and always checks the paperwork. You've got vans coming every couple of days. He's, he's really unhappy about that. Okay, so we need to bring Ron with us as well. And this idea that we need to change the relationship with our suppliers and our customers, if we don't think to do that, again, we get none of the benefit. It's like, oh, oh, okay. So let's take another example. ERP. So who, who's heard of ERP? All the, there we go. So that's a generational thing, right? That's 70s and 80s, 90s. Okay. So a lot of people in this room grew up with very big, very slow moving ERP systems. ERP was another seismic shift in enterprise, certainly. ERP was the idea that organizations have data, and that data is usually in silos. And because that data is in silos, it's expensive and slow to obtain that data. And so then we kind of shore up our world and say, well, we can't really move quickly. What we'll do is we'll make the best decisions we can given what we know. So the sales silo makes the sales policy decisions, and the manufacturing, the engineering silo makes engineering decisions, and the production silo and the sales. So all these different silos are all busy doing their thing. Okay, ERP comes along and says, <clears throat> in much the same way as MRP, install these systems. You can now have access to real-time data about stocks, about sales, about utilization, about people, about movement of stuff, uh, everything, all your business metrics that allow you to make good commercial decisions, good operational decisions, are at your fingertips. You just need to pay, you know, 15 million euros and kit out a data center and have you know, 28 SAP consultants in your building for the next four years, and the rest is gravy. It's easy. Yeah, wow, I want some of that. Yeah, so 12 million euros, I stand to save 100 million euros. This is chump change, sure, go. And then, of course, story after story of organizations who took on these huge systems and huge transformations and nothing really changed, and they're like, oh. Okay, we've sunk 12 million in, and our current calculations are we've saved uh, 489 euros in supply chain. Yeah. Great, and how much did you spend on that? Yes, yes, basically the farm, right? So again, we can unpack this in terms of how do those four questions land? So the first question, what's the power of ERP? I can now collect, I can process, I can present information across the enterprise. All three of those activities are really hard. Collecting data in any kind of real time is really, really hard in a big organization manually. Okay? And also, people make stuff up, right? because they, they tell you what you want to hear rather than what you, what you should really hear. And across the enterprise is now we're going across silos. That was a huge deal. So okay, what limitation, then, does this diminish? Right? What's, the, what's the sales pitch? What's the benefits case? Well, so the real limitation is ignorance. 
Okay, it's ignorance of what other groups in the enterprise are doing, and so I need to make local decisions. So what kinds of things did we do before ERP? This is a really tough question, because the answer is all the things. <laughs> all the things you do in an organization that are around process, governance, oversight, program management, you name it, anything you do that's about information, which in, in knowledge work is most of the things, yeah, and in fact in enterprise is most of the things, are about having to make decisions. So the most obvious one is we focus on utilization. Okay? Um, uh, Donald uh, Reinertsen says wonderfully, he says a bad model is better than no model. So the model we're going to go with is utilization. I've got all these expensive people, I hope you're expensive, right? All these expensive people, and, and I, need to, well, to, I need to sweat my assets, right? I need to keep them all busy. So what I want is for all of you to do a timesheet, and I want you to tell me exactly how you're spending every single minute of your day. You know, and then one of the things that you notice over time is that 20% of people's time is allocated to filling in timesheets. Yeah. But so, so I need to know where my spend is going. Okay? And so I want to check utilization. And then we invent a thing called cost accounting. We invented that. That didn't used to exist. It's not an enormously um, intuitive thing. Yeah? Cost accounting says, if I can maximize utilization for my assets, then I'm getting the most value I possibly can from my assets. So I think of the world as static and largely hierarchical. And if I have someone who's head of sales, and, and he's responsible for my sales activities, and he says, OK, well, you, you need to maximize your sales assets. And he has a bunch of sales managers, and they need to maximize their teams right the way down. Yeah, to, the, to, the, to the plebs on the ground. And then, and then she, she's my production uh, manager, and she's got to do, do exactly the same thing for all my production people. So that's what cost accounting does. It says, I need to make decisions. I don't know what sales is up to. I'm production. I don't know what sales is up to. I don't know what dispatch is up to. I don't know what marketing is up to, because I don't have access to that information. I can ask my peers, but that information is you know, weeks or months out of date yeah, by the time it filters up the chain of command. So I need to make local decisions, and I do that using a whole bunch of mo models called cost accounting. And so that means now that we start getting this really perverse organizational thing where anything that isn't sales is a cost center. Okay? So IT is a cost center. Engineering is a cost center. Uh, production is a cost center. Anything that doesn't involve someone actually transacting cash coming into the business is seen as a cost center. And so because I don't understand how value works in my organization, the only lever I've got is cost. So I drive that down. Yeah? And what happens when you drive that down? All the bad things. So now what can I do? What new rules do I need? Well, the new rules I need are about a thing called throughput accounting. So again, Ellie Goldratt describes this in the goal. There are only three numbers you need to run a business. There are only three accounting numbers you need to run a business. The first is called inventory. Inventory is how much money have I spent on things that I intend to sell. So all the bits I've bought that I'm then going to do stuff to and sell, that's my inventory. Okay. Throughput is sales, right? Throughput is I've now built all these things and I'm shipping all these things and people are paying me money. So throughput is all your revenue and whatever else. And the other number, operating expense. So operating expense is how much does it cost me to turn my inventory into throughput? It sounds incredibly simple because it is, right? The problem with it is you need to be able to see the whole system in order to be able to answer those questions. If the system is four people sitting in a garage, it's easy to calculate inventory, operating expense, and throughput. If the organization is 3,000 people, it is well nigh impossible. <clears throat> so you, what you do is you fall back on a bad model. You fall back on cost accounting. And we want to measure flow of value. So that means how work is happening and how, how, how people are adding value. We need to do that holistically across the whole organization. So that's the first thing we need to do. Weirdly, and this is countercultural, okay, we need to collaborate. <laughs> I know, right? Salespeople talking to engineering people, talking to production people, talking to... That doesn't happen. They're different tribes. They have different language. Yeah, there's a lovely one of my favorite Swedish phrases. When you're talking to farmers, use farmers' words. Yeah, and the, the, the whole version is, and when you're speaking to students, speak Latin. When you're talking to farmers, use farmers' words. So when I'm talking to accountants, I should be talking about numbers, but I don't. I'm a software engineer and I'm agile, so I talk about story points and sprints and burn up and burn down, and they go, yeah, right. Yeah, right, show me the money. I'm like, oh, no, but I'm delivering value. So we need to collaborate across divisions, across silos. And the weird thing is all parts of the organization are seen as value creation because they are. 
Once I can start connecting all the pieces up, I can see that some software written here enabled some business capability over here, which made us some money, or increased customers, or reduced uh, churn, or did something, moved some business dial. And because I can equate now, I can associate the work with the value, I've now got two levers. I've got the cost lever and the value lever. Okay? So, so what? So this then sort of led me to my second insight, which is rules for coping aren't just policy. Rules for coping become law. Okay? There's a set of practices called GARP, Generally Accepted Accounting Practices. And GARP is how businesses, how listed companies, have to do their maths. It's how they have to present their results to the market so that all of the companies can be measured equally. And GARP is entirely based on cost accounting principles. And so that means that GARP like, like the law, literally the law says, I cannot use throughput accounting unless I also jump through some hoops to make up the equivalent cost accounting figures. Right? So Jeff Bezos famously just threw that in the bin. He said, look, if you want a quarterly shareholder, blah, 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 go invest in something else. Because I'm, I'm obsessing about customers, and I'm obsessing about making customers happy. And then in 2003 he opened up a part of his organization that is internal uh, acquisition of, of uh, servers and things, like how, how I as an Amazon team get a server, and he opened that up to the world, um, called it Amazon Web Services, and created a billion dollar industry overnight. Smart lad, yeah? So because he's obsessing about the value chain, and he's obsessing about the flow of value to the customer, rather than cost accounting. Loads and loads of other companies are trying to replicate this, and they can't because they're stuck in the existing rules that are keeping them in place. Oh dear. So then, here's one. One of the most fun things about putting this talk together was finding word clouds. I challenge you to Google for cloud word cloud <laughs> and find a word cloud about cloud <laughs> in less than about two hours. Because <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> anyway, here is, here is a, a slightly doctored word cloud about cloud. So cloud, my first real encounter with, and I guess really it's virtualization so much as cloud. So cloud is probably the most significant shift in IT, I think, in technology in the last decade. Um, it's flipped the whole model on its head. I remember I was working at a, a well-known bank in the UK um, in 2007, so I was still at ThoughtWorks then. And, um, and they, they, they were one of the early adopters of VMs. So you had these VM farms, and they were you know, repurposing some of their old mainframes as VMs, which was pretty cool. And, uh, and so we said, oh, great, so um, we're going to need to get a VM. And they said, oh, you're going to need to fill in a form for that. I said, well, what kind of form? They said, well, it's a procurement form for a server. I was like, I don't know, the server's already there. <laughs> what we want is for you to just let us put our software on it. Uh, it's procurement. It's a server. And I was like, this is really silly. It wasn't as silly as once we got our server with our one gig of memory, and I wanted to have two gigs of memory, and they went, oh, that's procurement. The memory's already in the machine. You need to turn it down. No. Nope, you're going to need to fill out this form. Have you filled in your TPS sheets? Right? It was clearly bonkers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there's interesting. There's a number of theories around where this. Or who 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 can claim to have invented cloud computing or first proposed it? There's a chap called uh, Linklider, um, who was one of the original DARPA team that, that invented the ARPANET. And he was talking about you know, networked computers that, that you didn't really know where they were, but you didn't have to know where they were. John McCarthy, famously inventor of Lisp, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, one of my favorite observations recently, there's a guy called Thomas J. Watson, who was uh, the original CEO of IBM. So he was uh, 1914, he took over IBM. It was going in 1914. It wasn't called IBM then. He renamed it to International Business Machines. And he was a CEO there until like the 50s. In fact, until he died in 1957. And he famously said, sometime in the 40s, he said, the world will never need more than five or six computers. I can envisage that the world will never see more. And I, it's always been you know, one of those uh, schoolboy, schoolgirl kind of chuckling moments where you go, <laughs> five or six computers. And then you look around, and you've got Amazon, Azure, uh, Google, Bluemix. Right? We're probably going to end up with five or six computers. They're just really big computers. I reckon he was about a half a century ahead of his time. <laughs> this multi-core thing, multi-core uh, supercomputer beast in my pocket, is merely an access portal to the real computers. 
we are going to end up with about five or six computers. So, yeah, this has been weird trying to get this in. Who's, who's on some kind of cloud, you know, public cloud transition thing in their work at the moment? Right? Keep your hand up if it's going well. Wow, a few hands stayed up. That's fantastic. That's great. Most, most organizations are really struggling with this. So let's take a look at this then. <clears throat> well, the first thing is clearly is on-demand compute power. Right? That's the first thing I want. Can I, this is the, the, the power that cloud gives me is on-demand computing. That's never existed before. So what limitation does that diminish? This is a little bit more subtle. The limitation it diminishes is the cost and risk of running your own data center. Now, this is a trade-off, because there's a lot of upside to running your own data center as well. If you're dealing with lat latency-sensitive things and whatever else, or high-security things, then you may well want your own data center. But it's very, typically very costly, very risky to run your own data center. And also, you've got physical tin, and physical tin is limited by physicality, by you know, buying and selling and shifting and moving things around. If it's someone else's tin, it's, you know, it's virtualized completely and it's public cloud, I have a lot more options. So what were the rules then <clears throat> that were um, enabling us to deal with this limitation, with, this, uh, with our public cloud, with, with, our, with our data center limitation? Well, it's things like procurement, maintenance, decommissioning, the whole life cycle of hardware, the whole, the whole uh, management of hardware. All of those things are expensive. That's one of the rules, right? Be aware that hardware is expensive. Don't just go chucking it around. So you go, okay, then, what does that mean? Computer hardware requires lots of people to look after it, lots of different kinds of people. So you've got data center engineers, networking, infrastructure, security. There's a whole raft of different people. And again, remember, we're still in our cost-accounted world, so they're in silos and they don't collaborate very much because, see previous slide. And so we need lots of people okay, to look after it. And all of this means that these decisions around hardware, which we think of as capex, capital expenditure, right? it's money, it's amortized value and all that, they're expensive and they require lots of governance. Okay? So lots of ceremony, and that's the world we live in. And so, okay, we're going, well, let's assume none of that was true anymore. If we unpack all those rules, <clears throat> what kind of things, I'm really going to need to speed up a lot, what kind of things are we are going to help us then work in this new world? Well, the first thing, the first new rule is I can explore ideas really quickly, really inexpensively. Okay? All of our processes in most organizations are not set up to support that kind of working. There's a huge shift at the moment. Lots of organizations are on this transformational journey, or whatever they might call it, to try and suck less at doing small things quickly. Yeah? Here's a mad idea. Once I've bought something, I can switch it off. Right? I can reduce this compute power as easily as I can increase it. It's a dial. It's literally utility. It's insane. And so all of my thinking about because part of this is optionality, so I, I'm thinking in options. I, I've, I've bought this thing, well, my options now are sell it at a massive loss, right, or, or keep it and try and force people to use it and amortize, you know, amortize the, the, the cost of use. But if I can reduce computing power as easily as, as increasing it, it means that those decisions are now much more reversible. The cost of making a bad decision is much lower. The cost of reversing that decision is much lower. And I'm renting compute power. That's my mental model. I'm renting compute power. I'm not buying servers. And that's a whole different lot of thinking that we do. So now again, <clears throat> this is where these rules start really impacting things, because now they become structure. They become how the organization works. So we've got lots of people, and these people are specialists, OK? And they're expensive, and we have governance and, and ceremony and all that kind of thing. These people are not going to cede their power quickly. So, this is in direct conflict with this idea of reducing compute power. Yeah? Well, if it's high ceremony, I don't want it to be easy to undo these things. Or I don't want to believe it's easy to undo these things. And then finally, very briefly, continuous delivery. So a lot of people here, I hope, are practicing continuous delivery or on their way there. So again, what does it give us? It gives us the ability to eliminate, simplify, automate releasing software. By the way, you should do it in that order. So I look at my process, and I say, what parts of this process can I eliminate? What parts are vestigial? Then, given what's left that I have to do, how can I simplify that? And finally, then, what of that simplified process can I automate? So that's the offer. That's the deal. Okay? So what limitation does that diminish? It means I don't have high risk releases. It means I don't have high transaction cost releases anymore, which means I can release smaller things. That's kind of cool. 
it reduces bottlenecks at specialists. So I have all these gates that I have sign-offs of, of uh, uh, what's it called, change boards, cabs, and I have uh, various things that have the word authority after them, so design authorities and security authorities and, and a bunch of other high-status people who walk around the building and typically in suits saying, no, none shall pass. So the rules I currently have are this. Fixing mistakes will be expensive and time-consuming, so I front-load the risk. If I don't front load the risk, bad things are going to happen. And we've all lived bad things. Okay? We've all been there. Well, the, 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 the more gnarly of you with the tie, you know, with the crow's feet around your eyes, have done those you know, 2, 3, 4 a.m. Saturday night releases, right, where it didn't go right the first three times and you couldn't eat any more pizza. Okay, so fixing any mistakes is going to be expensive and time consuming. Managing the risk then <coughs> requires specialists to check things manually because that's what we do. We pour through these things. So, what new rules am I going to need? Well, I'm going to need to enshrine specialist knowledge. Rather than having it trapped in the heads of specialists, what I want is I want self-evidencing processes. In other words, by doing this, it has to be secure. By doing this, it has to be compliant. Okay? Um, look up, uh, for, as a fun thing afterwards, 18F, which is an organization in the States that was assembled very quickly to fix the healthcare.gov disaster. Billions of dollars uh, healthcare system could deal with about 14 concurrent users rather than 320 million, um, and then a bunch of jokers rebuilt the whole thing in about eight weeks, because it's a website, right? <laughs> and, and what they figured on the way through was the, they, they, well, they waded through this sea of, um, of documents around different compliance things and boxes they had to check, and they managed to automate almost all of it. It's a great, great story. So you create the, make the process self-evidencing. By the time I come to release, I'm already compliant, secure, uh, scalable, all those other things. It, I can't not be. I can't not to have got this stage and be. It means I can slice work into small, valuable increments. Right? The transaction cost comes down. I can release things smaller. I can release things more valuable. I can get feedback faster. It's all win. Here's a fun thing. Everyone needs to learn how to automate. Right? We're all programmers now. Yeah? So everyone in the organization is thinking, how can I simplify, eliminate, automate the work I need to do? So now the rules become culture. And this is where it gets really, really tough to unpick these things. Okay, if we believe and act as though fixing mistakes is expensive and time-consuming and these specialists are somehow elevated, holy people, and then we're saying, well, actually, anyone can pick this stuff up. Go learn Python, you'll be fine. Right? And by the way, we've institutionalized, we've made tools that mean that most of your specialist knowledge is now enshrined in those tools. So we need you to make sure the tools are okay, but you don't get to do the non shell pass thing anymore. You get to be advisors rather than gatekeepers. And some people are like, yay, we can get work done. And a lot of people are like, no, I lose my status. Okay. So then, what can we do? How can we break the rules? Let's go through this quickly. The first thing is we need to understand the power of the new technology. So all I've done is I've taken Goldratt's four questions and I've flipped them into statements. Okay. He's asking, what is the power of the new technology? So we need to understand it. So we need to ask some questions. What does it do? How does it work? Think of this as a checklist, right? Will it work for us? Is this going to work the same way for us? Or is this just blurb? Yeah? And how can we exploit this technology? It's cool, but is it actually useful? Is it going to be valuable in our world? Or is it just interesting looking? And then we want to recognize the limitation that the technology will diminish. Because if we can't see that, we can't know whether the thing's working. Yeah. So how could I prove that the limitation is holding me back? What could you do? What experiment could you set up to prove that the limitation is holding you back? Is it just a, um, a, a what's it called, a limiting belief, right? Uh, and so, for instance, one organisation I'm working in, absolutely convinced that uh, they need to increase the size of the teams that they have because their problem is capacity. And then we did a bit of work, a bit of value stream mapping, and it turns out there's three significant pieces of work that are backed up at release because the path to live is really, really bumpy and manual and error prone. And so each of those things has to go through one at a time slowly. And so if we doubled capacity for development, we'd now have six things waiting, unable to be released. Yeah? Rather than ramping up a small army, let's take some of those people and point them at the path to live problem. Let's understand, and this is theory of constraints again, let's understand where the system is constrained and widen that constraint. And so that limitation of the ability of, of being able to deliver stuff faster 
oh, great, let's, let's adopt this technology. It's not going to help us. We, we managed to prove that that limitation, it is a limitation, it will eventually be a limitation, but right now it's not the narrowest part of the pipe. How would you know if we adopted this technology that that limitation was diminishing? How would you know things were getting better? What could you measure? So this gets into metrics and flow and some of those kind of things, right? How, what, what experiments can we set up to say, let's adopt this technology, let's adopt this idea and see whether it helps us? And what's our control group? Maybe it's just a fluke, right? Maybe we're going to try this experiment and then do you know what happened? Um, things got better. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, I can't think of the guy's name. It'll come to me in a second. But a whole series of experiments in the 1920s in a factory. You'll remember the factory. And it was uh, the... Um, the Hawthorne, thank you, Hawthorne effect. So this chap Hawthorne, and he was in this factory and he was measuring things. He said, right, so let's figure out how we can get people in this factory to work better. And so they tried dropping the temperature by a couple of degrees. And people's work rate increased. And they went, oh, making the room colder, people work faster. And, and then, but they noticed it tailed off. And they went, oh. And so they tried making it warmer a couple of degrees. And people work faster. And went, oh, wait, warmer rooms make people work faster. Ooh. And then it tailed off. And then he said, what if we change the lighting? And the lighting went slightly dimmer, and people work faster. And like, oh, people work better in low light. What was actually happening was this. Every time you mucked around with the environment, the people there going, oh, they're watching again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the bosses up in the galley. Oh, where are they? Oh, there he is. <laughs> better keep at it. Right? But you can't. That's not sustainable. So eventually you slow down and go back to. So this thing where you muck around with the system and you think you've made an improvement. Yeah? What's your control group? Do you have a control group? If not, how can you counter for some of those sampling biases and other uh, measurement biases, statistical biases? We need to identify the existing rules that are used to manage the limitation. This is generally really hard, is what I'll say, because they're hiding in plain sight. They're just what we do. The word just appears a lot when you're looking for these limitations. But we just do that. Just anyone does that. Why, why would you not do that? Well, because, right? So how will those rules get in the way? So what assumptions are those rules making that are true of the existing system that the new technology is going to break those assumptions? How do we challenge those assumptions? In particular, let's look at ownership now. Now I'm going to start looking to Kate Gray. See? And I'm going to start saying, who might be threatened by dismantling those existing structures? Because those structures have people, and people have status, and people's status is emotionally attached to some of that stuff. If we're going to dismantle that, how do we do that in a safe way? How do we find our... Uh, our strong and weak support, and how do we find our strong and weak opposition, and how do we start working with those different communities to, uh, to make sense of that. If you don't understand what I mean by strong and weak support or strong and weak opposition, uh, then come along to Kate Gray and Chris Young's talk tomorrow. He says, plugging it, which I suspect is going to look at that, and is a very, very powerful model. How can we make it safe to change? Right? If someone wants to come on the journey, how do we help them on the journey? If they don't, we need to give them a graceful exit. How do we make it okay to say, you know, that X million quid that I th thought was going to, X million euros that I thought was going to be great to spend on that thing? Not so much. Yeah? But now I lose face by doing that. So how do we say, well, that was a great idea then. Let's see where, what's beyond that. How do we create graceful exits for people? And finally, how do we identify and implement the new rules? And this is where all of uh, Linda's fearless change stuff starts to appear, right? So how do we safely exploit this new technology? I want to use this thing, but it needs to be safe. And there's a community safety thing as well as a technical safety thing. How do we make it safe for the organization, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of safe, to try these things out? And what contraindications should I be looking for? Right? What things, what unexpected side effects might I have? Because if I'm looking at where I expect it to be, this is my confirmation bias again, I'm not looking over here at this thing blowing up. And even if I notice it blowing up out the corner of my eye, it's not me. It's a coincidence. Right? It, I happen to do this, and this thing happened to blow up. Could have happened to anyone. Right? And so, finally, then, how do we introduce and how do we institutionalize these new rules? Because we want to make these things normal. Who's going to own these new rules? Okay. So, there's some ways to break the rules, some things to think about with breaking the rules. What's the new technology? What power does it have? What uh, limitation does it diminish? What rules are we going to need to dismantle? And what new rules are we going to need to introduce and institutionalize? And if we can go through that sequence, we have a fighting chance of really exploiting that new technology. If we don't, it will fail, and we'll blame the technology. That's what we usually do. Or in actual fact, we blame the people who brought us the technology. We kick them out because we're a tribe and we close ranks. Yeah? So 
There's an awful lot to this statement. Technology can bring benefits if and only if it diminishes a limitation. I would say very much I would encourage those who've read The Goal to go and listen to Beyond The Goal. It's a wonderful, wonderful series of lectures. For those who haven't read The Goal, start there. It's a fantastic story. In the meantime, go and break some rules. Thank you. <laughs>